are storytelling with data and beyond, using strategic communications and live stories to promote opioid safety. This webinar is brought to you by California Healthcare Foundation's Opioid Safety Coalitions Network. A bit of housekeeping before we get started. This session will be re recorded. Slides in the recording will be posted within a week on the CHCF website. All attendees will be muted for the duration of the presentation, but we encourage you to ask questions throughout and we'll address them as, as they come in. To ask a question, if you have any logistical questions about listening to the webinar, use chat to ask your question to the host. If you have questions for the speakers, use chat to all. And we do have a, a survey evaluation and we appreciate you taking a moment at the end of the webinar to give us feedback today's speakers. I am Liz Galicia. I am Vice President at IE Communications, a policy advocacy and strategic communications firm in Oakland. And I'm Acting Communications Officer for the Opioid Safety Coalitions Network. I'm joined by Laura Sapanara, who's a communications strategist and consultant, and who has been working with public health departments throughout the state on combining data and storytelling on the Live Stories platform. And we're excited to have her here today sharing in her expertise. So there we are, Lauren Liz. <laughs> Today's agenda. What does it mean to be strategic in communicating about opioid safety? Um, getting a game plan. Uh, we'll walk through some examples of live stories. Um, and we'll show you building a live story in real time. Hold on. Oh, wow. Let's go back. Um, and we'll talk about distribution and spreading the word. And uh, today's objectives. So we'll want to offer you a strategic approach to promoting opioid safety. You'll begin working with tools and assets for effective communications and gain a working knowledge of the Live Stories platform. And just a note here that as the communications coach for the coalitions, and I look forward to working with a lot of you here on this webinar to take what we learned today as a starting point and help you figure out how to build a Live Story and the kind of materials that work for you. Okay, why strategic communications? So as we've seen, awareness of the opioid, opioids crisis is going up. Not a day goes by without multiple stories, uh, the administration, policymakers weighing in. This is a, a great opportunity for communications to influence audiences and create uh, awareness that leads to impact. For that awareness to happen, uh, you need understanding and comprehension both of the problem and also of the solutions that can move audiences to action. And that's where st strategic communications can speak to multiple audiences. And you, as um, you're building your coalitions and doing this work, know better than anyone that um, opioid misuse and addressing it involves multiple stakeholders from a diverse range of backgrounds and perspectives. So when you're communicating with law enforcement, or um, parents of teenagers, or providers, um, your, or veterans. There's so many different stakeholders, and the messages that you would provide them in materials that you're communicating with them on will look different. And also the messengers who would be delivering those messages, you want to come from, from trusted audiences. So strategic communications can help you tailor the kind of messages you deliver to specific audiences and who would deliver those messages and with what methods. And another thing about why strategic communications for this issue is that opioid use is complex in that unlike something other public health issues like say obesity prevention where there's general consensus that public investment is necessary um, to address the problem and create solutions, anything having to do with drug use or addiction is saddled with a measure of stigma and fear and apathy. So by using strategic communications, you're employing data and evidence-based communications that can communicate to audiences where they are and show them why this matters and why it matters to them and why it matters for their community um, in a way that um, can help address some of those obstacles. In addition, there's the element of storytelling, of really putting a human face on this where people can be compelled to action. Okay, everybody. 
so glad you're here. We know you have a busy day, and um, we, we're really happy to be providing you with this content this morning. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> the game plan, excuse me, <clears throat> is a really simple model for thinking about the people you need to engage <clears throat> as distinct groups or audiences. There are four elements to the game plan, as you see here. Um, and the idea, as Liz, as Liz said, is that you're reaching out to audiences with a very specific goal. In fact, the more specific, the better. So let's look at a couple of examples of, game, of a game plan. OK, first example, um, you can see over here on the left, I have my very game components, goal, audience, message, engagement. Um, and my goal is to reduce opioid prescriptions. I've identified three audiences I'm going to begin working with. Um, they all have something in common, so they're easy to begin working with as a group. Um, and I've come up with fodder for messaging. And messaging, the way we're using that term today, is just simply the language that you're going to use to talk to your audiences, right? The meaning that you're going to impart, that you want to stick with them. So um, the ideas here for messaging are just examples. You are the experts you know or you are going to come to know how best to talk to your audiences. The point here is that we're aiming for a really tight fit between the messages and the audiences. Um, so, and the, the other point is that these messages are tightly related to our goal. Now here, the messenger is also key. We're going to talk about that more today. But um, in reaching hospitals and physicians and dentists, in other words, medical professionals, it's important that their peers, the peers that they respect, um, are called upon as messengers, right? Because they have leverage. Um, and we're all influenced by our peers. So, so one message might be simply to define um, what an appropriate and judicious use of opioids looks like, right? So, to um, impart, a, impart a new sense of that that is different from the status quo. Um, another, key, another key message might be to let, in a direct way, um, to let these medical professionals know that they can begin working with patients um, who are currently on risky regimens to get to safer doses. Um, another message would be, you know, here's a series of steps that you can follow to limit new starts on chronic opioid therapy, right? So it sounds pretty basic, um, and it is, but it's targeted, and it's well-conceived, and that's what we're aiming for. Now, let's say you've created a communications piece for these medical professionals. It could be a website. It could be a live story. How are you going to reach them? That's where engagement comes in. So what are the tools and tactics that your coalition can use? Um, for example, let's say you decide that you can reach primary care physicians on three listservs that you have access to. And you can ask a regional primary care association to post a note on Facebook with a link to your live story. Or um, you can, let's say, help integrate safe prescribing guidelines into training curricula at hospitals. These are all tactics for engagement. If you take a proactive approach to engagement, as a coalition, you will absolutely be more effective. So we're encouraging you to use this game plan rubric um, as a tool when you're brainstorming in groups. For example, let's say you're at a coalition meeting and the distribution of naloxone is, is your goal, is the goal that you're working with during that meeting. You could write down, uh, you know, at the top of a whiteboard, for example, that goal, and then lead your audience, lead your group in a in um, in a discussion about who the key audiences are, who's most important to reach, what are the messages, and then brainstorm your ideas for engagement. Get those on paper. Okay, here's another example of a game plan. Um, the goal here is to inform parents about the dangers of opioids um, and also what they can do. There's an assumption here that um, parents may have fear or anxiety or just misinformation about the issue, um, and that they will benefit from understanding the risks uh, presented by op op opioid prescriptions and the risks of having excess medication at, ha at home. So um, if I were creating a communications piece 
for parents in my community, um, I might want to do something like um, let people in the Twitter sphere who really care about the health of young people and the health of older people to know that I, I have this link with valuable information. Um, or I might create a flyer for pediatricians that they can hand to patients, right? Now these ideas are basic, but it's important, it's important to consider them, write them down, and then follow up, right? That's the, the magic of engagement. With no engagement, it's like baking a beautiful cake and not letting anyone eat it. Okay, so here are a couple of messages that might come in handy um, when you are creating something for parents as a distinct audience. Um, you might use language that you know, defines what opioid medications are, when they're helpful, when they're dangerous, what some of the risks are, um, particularly for young people, um, some steps about what they can do, um, and maybe what how they can talk to their kids about it, what, what you can do as a family if you feel like one of, if you have a, if one of your children has a, has a friend who seems to be at risk. Um, and okay, so enough said, you get the point about the, you get the point about the game plan rubric. Um, other messengers in this case might be, for example, pediatricians, child welfare workers, people from the community. All right. If you have questions about the game plan, could you go ahead and um, use the chat box to send them to us? You're welcome to do that throughout this webinar, um, and we'd love to hear from you. And, and I'd, I'd add something, Laura, to the, the M in game, that um, you have both a variation on messages, and you also have different messengers to deliver those messages. You want to look at um, when you're trying to reach an audience, who are the trusted messengers? Um, which will look really different, say, if you're trying to reach teens or you're trying to reach law enforcement. So who's going to deliver the message? Who would be the most effective um, in that regard? And, and think about that when you're thinking about crafting those messages. Okay. So if you have a game plan, then in a sense you have a strategic, a strategic communications plan. Okay. Um, now let's take a look at a couple of examples of how you might put one tool um, the live stories platform to work to engage the audiences that you've decided to reach. Some of you have may have seen this story before. You can find a link to it on the RX Safe Marin site. There we go. Um, I talked with one of the creators of the story, a woman named Karina Aramula who's there um, in the Marin County um, HHS, and she told me that the goal um, here was to create a report card, so a place to hold all of our data to track prescription drug misuse. Um, her coalition voted on 10 data elements to track over time, and they looked at examples of other report cards. They came up with this. And what we see here is short, well-crafted paragraphs that really contextualize the data. So this report card is all about presenting and contextualizing data. Um, you see pro we have prominent headlines. Um, you can see all of these wonderful charts. Right here, um, there's, you know, part of the contextualization here is just a couple of sentences about what the data portends. Um, and here, um, a reduction in the number of pills per narcotic prescription would reduce the amount of available drugs in the population. Um, I also want to point out here that one of their goals, if you, if you look at this part right here, was to double the number of prescribers registered in tiers. Um, in a one-year period, and you can see from this graph that they they did achieve that goal. So a very well-defined goal and a visualization of that goal. So the wheels are in motion here um, in terms of using live stories in a way that um, you know effective in terms of sharing data. Let's take a look at another example. Okay. Now, um, our friends in San Luis Obispo County 
um, have put this story together. It's a work in progress. They've been extremely kind about sharing the story with us today. And um, we have Claire and Julie from the Department of, from the uh, Opioid Safety Coalition on the line here. And they're going to, um, they are free to answer questions if you want to throw out questions over chat as we go through this story. Um, what we have here is a engaging uh, characterization of the problem. Um, and then, uh, which I, I, for some reason I particularly like this, per, this particular characterization. I would certainly steal it if I, if I were you. Um, and, um, and then they have inserted a graphic from the New York Times, um, a heat map that shows increases in uh, opioid overdoses and for the country as a whole. They're building in this beautiful quote using a story section in Live Stories. Um, that allows you to insert a quote in a photograph. Um, they've got a simple, just a simple short definition. Remember, less is often more. Um, the definition of an opioid. And then look here, they've really put the work of their coalition kind of front and center. Um, so up top here we have an introduction to the coalition. Um, and, and then they jump right into like, the work that's already in play on the ground. And they're inviting you here to, to, to read a description of each of the action teams. And then they're going to build additional, um, additional pages so that if I'm, if I'm a community member, I'm interested in serving on the data monitoring collection uh, action team, I can just click here to learn more and get involved. And then you're thinking, where's the data? Where's the data? Well, there's a ton of good data here. They just decided to put it below the kind of focus on solutions. Um, so obviously, there are links. There are links to this story um, in these slides that you have access. That you'll have access to. It'll be easy to revisit this story. Um, take a look at the data they decided to include. Um, one of the one of the recommendations that we've made is uh, is to maybe. Um, put some of the data together. There are story sections in live stories that you can use to put data side by side. So two charts side by side. And that might mean that um, uh, basically we have to scroll. We're, we're not scrolling down quite as far to get to the end. And um, it might be that they, it, I mean, I, I might recommend, you know, uh, just revisiting and, and taking a look. And it, does all this data serve a purpose? serves a purpose for this story, because it's a lot to move through. But the, the answer may be yes. OK, if you have questions for the wonderful Claire Herman um, of San Luis Obispo, please go ahead and send them to us via chat. And a note on, on the live stories that we're looking at now. Obviously, there's some coalitions that have been working in live stories already, either for quite a while, such as Marin and San Luis Obispo is dove right in. Some of you will feel like, you know, you're just getting started. Live Stories is available for technical assistance. We'll be working, I'll be helping you work through how you're going to build the storytelling around your data. So you can feel like you can come in. And these are examples of different ways to approach the platform in varying levels of, of function. So people have expressed to us that they want, some people don't have a website for their coalition yet or really want um, something like a calling card where they can, when they want to send people to a place, a site where they can explain more about the coalition and give background on what is happening in their specific county, they have a website to do that. The live story can serve that function. And for San Luis Obispo, this very well could. It explicates the data. It talks about what the coalition work that's happening and has a call to action to get involved. With Marin, it's the report card approach of really being able to explain through data what's going on in the county, and then to be able to go back in and update that as new data becomes available. So there's a lot of different approaches. And we look forward to working with you and figure out what the needs are of your own coalition and using live stories. Wonderful. OK. Um, I'm going to show you, just, just for fun, a very different type of use of live stories, a totally different issue area, just so you can see what a well-developed story looks like. So um, this is something that I helped create with my co with colleagues over at the Public Health Institute. And um, 
a very interesting issue. How can we reduce the number of medically unnecessary C-sections in California? An issue that's near and dear to the hearts of the folks that work at the California Healthcare Foundation. Um, and so what we see here is, uh, is a, a nice banner image, a beautiful headline. Um, making the most of your headline space is important. And, um, and then some photographs. Um, a use of the quote story section in live stories to highlight an interesting fact. Um, he were looking at the C-section rate, the rise in C-sections over time. We built in links to some really, truly valuable material uh, that contextualizes this phenomenon, um, including an infographic called A Tale of Two Births. Um, that's one of the best, I think, health-related infographics I've ever seen comes from CHCS. And, um, and then just other, other information about, you know, hospitals that are already succeeding, so that kind of like look at success stories that can help engage and inspire people that might think that the, that the issue is intractable, were they not to read about what's already, the progress that's already happening. Um, and then we decided to include a look at cost. Uh, um, so we're juxtaposing here, and again, this is a very simple data visualization, but a powerful one. So um, the cost differential between uh, C-sections and vaginal birth. This is, um, and you know, many of you were on the webinar on May 11th, where Pam Carlson from Live Stories and Andy Krakow um, kind of went through a lot of the functions that are available to you in Live Stories. So this is an example of one that we talked about then which is just um, organizing information by counties. So using this live stories function, which is a universal filter, um, to look at, in this case, the C-section rates in different counties. Um, so you can see how uh, a similar data visualization might come in handy for you with the data that you, that, that you already have in your account, with your data. OK, and then I'll just, I'm going to scan down here kind of quickly. Um, just to show you that uh, we happen to find magically um, some, in terms of step forward, um, a, a video that was created that um, features some physicians at a public hospital here in, Co in Contra Costa County that um, is specializing in vaginal births after C-sections. Not, not specializing; they're doing they're doing a very good job in in maximizing the rate of vaginal birth following C-section. So this is an, a really uh, um, important story in terms of what it means to put solutions in place. And so we, we didn't have to go out and film that story. It, um, it was already there, and we included a video link right here. Um, so all that to get you thinking about short videos that might already be available for you, for you to incorporate into your live story. And a, a question that's come in asking if there's a recommended length for a live story. Great question, because you know, I I confess that I I think that this particular story that I'm showing you right now is a little bit too long. Um, and so since we have that question, I'm going to show you one more story really quickly. Also comes from our friends in um, in San Luis Obispo. I love this story for its length. So now the real answer to your question is you only want to provide the information that you think is most important, right? Everybody is busy and everybody is inundated with information. So you have to have, you, you really, you have to be honest with yourself and kind of grieve over data and text that you might want to include but that actually could slow the story down. So, and I would also add to that that you should just know that people may stop scrolling. So you right. do want to prioritize the information you need up top and know that, that there's a good chance that a fair number of readers may not get to the bottom if it's, if it's longer. Right. Exactly. We're always, we're always, no matter how great our content is, the busy, busy interactive world, we're always at risk of losing people. Okay. So we have these beautiful elders, um, and then we have... Um, a, a wonderful quote that kind of right here gets at the vulnerability of elders who take a fall and then their lives are changed after that. Um, and then we have a look here at um, the number of EMS calls 
that are fall related. So there are five seniors go to the emergency department um, every day in San Luis Obispo County. There are some differences among the different um, areas of the county, differences in, in the rates of fall. Oh. Um, and then, um, so, so there are two really powerful data points um, here. And one, one is um, simply, if you were to just, you could create a shorter story. I actually think the story is the perfect length, but you, 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 um, it, it would be possible to create a to create a story that focused really on this piece. Um, so this proportion of calls to EMS that are falls related, and then look at this down here. This is um, the rise in the in the the uh, proportion of Californians that are going to be over the age of of 85 by the year 2050. So if you put those two pieces together, there's a, it's a pretty strong call to action in terms of we need to do something and, and, and we need to get on it when it comes to primary and secondary strategies for preventing falls. Okay, I hope that, I hope that is a, an answer to the question about how long is too long. Um, I don't think you're at risk of making stories that are too short. Um, one of the things that you can do is actually show the stories to your target audience, like in a small focus group or even just online, and ask for their feedback and ask them to be honest with you about whether it's sufficiently engaging that they've made it to the bottom of the story, they, that they scrolled down. Okay. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Liz here, um, and she is going to show you um, an array of materials that she has put together. Okay. Good. Sorry. Okay. Okay. We will get up to speed here. So, live stories as a strategic communications tool. We're going to walk you through building your own live story. And before we do that, I wanted to introduce you to something we've been building as in communications support for the coalitions. And that's an asset library that lives on the Opioid Safety Coalition shared drive, shared Google Drive, in the communications folder called Live Stories Assets. So I'm going to walk you through some of these folders. What we've tried to do, knowing everybody's busy, you have your work to be done and don't necessarily have time and resources to go out and either gather materials that are available or to create original materials or a designer on hand to, to whip up an infographic. What we wanted to do is provide you, look at what's out there, what campaigns exist, what other messages and materials have been created that you could, um, with credit, um, offer up and um, use in your live stories or other materials. So we have one folder that does show materials that other coalitions have made, whether they're flyers, toolkits, uh, fact sheets, um, to, that you can review, see what you like, see what you might want to replicate. Um, so that's available to you there. Uh, we have a folder that's infographics and other visuals that we've pulled. It can be anything from some of the stats you see and facts that have been um, that have been given some design attention to more um, involved infographics that try to um, walk you through um, some of the data in, in um, infographic form. Um, some of it is as much as we're, when we're looking around and seeing materials, um, we want to make them available with credit. So the White House put together this GIF, um, an animated GIF showing drug overdoses now taking more lives every year than traffic accidents. This is something that would take an animator and a data analyst some work to build. If you credit whitehouse.gov, this is yours, yours to use. Um, so a couple of other places. So we encourage you to go into this folder, look around at the different assets. What we'll do is we'll work with you individually to see what type of story you're going to build, what are the assets you want to use, what might be just right for this 
for, for a story you're building. It may be that um, you know, this one is talking about the brain and addiction, and that could be, and there's already this um, visual that's built. You wouldn't have to commission someone to do it or pay for that. Um, I'll just show you a couple of other examples. Um, we did build some um, animated maps by county um, showing um, over time, from 2004 to 2014, um, the um, change in overdose uh, pres prescription deaths, um, and actually this one goes year by year, so from 2004, 5, through 2015. And this is actually essentially a JPEG and can be dropped into a story. And we have one of those, um, thanks to um, my staff, Turner Canty, we have one of those for each of the counties each of the counties uh, represented in the Opioid Safety Coalition Network. So there, there's a range of assets. I encourage you to go onto the drive, look through them, and then I'll work with you to see what might be right uh, for you moving forward. If you have questions about the assets in the drive, please feel free to use the chat function and send them in and Liz will is able to answer some of those. And we'll make sure that you have the direct link to those assets as well after this webinar. Okay, so all of you have access to live stories and I think some of you have already logged in. This is what, um, this is what it looks like when you log in. I'm on a couple of different teams. So, I, and, and I'm taking a look in um, the Marin County team account. They have loaded a great deal of data in here, so there's more data in here than you will see um, when you log into your account, most likely. Um, and what I'm going to do is kind of walk you through what it's like to go ahead and create a story in Live Stories. And this is what Pam did um, on May 11th, and I'm just kind of building on the work that, that the path that she set forth, especially for those of you who, um, who haven't really gotten the hang of, haven't logged in or haven't gotten the hang of live stories yet. So this is what it looks like when you're, when you're ready to build a new story. And let's say that you have um, come up with a game plan and you have your goal and your audiences um, in mind, and you've kind of crafted on paper um, kind of an outline of what you think your story should look like. And you can come into live stories, begin a new story. And while you're doing that, I actually did have a question come in about, um, a couple questions come in about the, the um, assets library. First one um, asked whether um, we'll be continuing to add to that, and, and I didn't mention that, and I should have. This is a work in progress. We will continue to curate that and make sure we're pulling in um, effective tools for you to choose from. And we also welcome submissions. So if you want to send me what you think would be a great tool that would be, um, that could be shared with credit, please do that. Um, and I've also, we will definitely provide the URL to the, to the Google Drive and I can do that. We'll do that with the materials at the end of this webinar and I'm happy to um, give that to people individually as well. Okay. So I'm not going to do a ton of talking. I am just going to kind of, in meditative fashion, sort of show you what it's like to go into, here we are in live stories. Um, this is what the blank story looks like after you press the new story button. I click here, and it allows me to insert a banner image. I've saved, I've, I grabbed a banner image from the, um, the assets folder that Liz just showed you. Um, and I put it on my desktop just to make it easy to grab. And here I'm inserting it. Looks good. Um, and then I'm able to type in a title, like um, something like we like the title "Prescription for Safe Pain Management." But we've decided ahead of time that um, one of the things we want to do is to create to create this live story with both patients and physicians in mind. Um, so 
but to give them data and some narrative that might be helpful to both patients and physicians. And there are plenty of assets in the folder that can help you do that. So um, I'm going to grab a chart from a dashboard. And I, if you, let me just do that again. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm moving the cursor over here in this section that's inside my story. And I'm just going to go ahead and click Chart from Dashboard. And look at the charts that come up. There's a whole array of charts that are generated automatically. That's one of the things that Live Stories does well. I'm going to take this one and then add it to the story. And there it is. Now I have my data right there. Um, and then the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use the outline that I created on my um, desktop. And while you're doing that, um, one other comment about the asset library. One thing that we did try to do is pull in um, stories and assets and uh, that were local. So whether it's we have some media coverage where you could pull out a quote that's specific to a coalition, or we have a spokesperson from a coalition, whether it's Joe Greaves from Alameda Contra Costa County, um, Ronit Lev from San Diego. So there are assets there that are specific um, to your coalition. But much of it is either statewide or looking nationally, because you really are the ones that have access. You're building your coalitions. You have the connections. And you can get those kind of local stories, whether it's by a video or getting a quote. So this is a start, but we are really are hoping that there will be a possibility to capture the really unique stories that, that really illustrate both the, the, the suffering and the solutions going on at the at the county and coalition level to help bolster your story. Okay, so I'm going to grab um, okay. having a little, I'm having a technical challenge as I often do, just bear with me. Do that and see. Um, okay, let's Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have to work in technical challenges <laughs> working with live stories or it just wouldn't be authentic. That's right. It's also it's also a case that um I think, I have a feeling that many people that are on this call are um, technically adept, and I just want to say that personally, I am not like an early adopter, and um, I, challenge, I challenge myself, and it's funny, if some of my friends knew that I was like, if I was, that I was doing this on a webinar, they would be really, they would be laughing at me, but the thing is, is I've been working in live stories for about a year, and um, I do find it really easy to use. I find it gratifying. So what I'm doing here is um, I just grabbed some text that I had written like as an introduction. And I placed it into this little section. And I just wanted, you're calling it introduction. I will say that, um, oh, yeah. You, I, I'm going to let her off the hook for the moment, <laughs> but I do want to emphasize that headlines are key. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the webinar, but you're really grabbing people's attention with, a, with the headline, and the only way they're really going to read on with the text is there's something that, that is going to grab the attention. Yes. Very good. So um, right now, one of, the things, one of the things we can do in Life Stories is you get on the right here, this right bar, this right hand bar, um, allows us to rename the story sections that we're creating. And this helps us when we want to change, uh, when we want to change the order of the section. And I'll show you that in a minute. So I'm going to go ahead and grab another image. So here's a 
another, here's another look at overdose deaths, for example. And I can go ahead and grab I've got some text here that um, is about patients and physicians working together. And you'll notice that Laura's working off of a Word document or a Google Doc that's in Word. I, we do encourage you that when you're building a story, and again, we can help you do this, that you map out, you storyboard that story before you load it into live stories. It can help you with sequencing. You might want to move things around. It can help you figure out how you're going to move from section to section. Um, you can also share that with others in your coalition and get feedback before you load it actually into the live story platform. What I'm doing here is just like in, in many other programs where I'm inserting a link. Um, we've got these CDC safe prescribing guidelines. Um, and so Um, it, it would be easy for us to just create a, to go ahead and create a link. Just like the same way that other, just cutting and pasting the URL, the same way that so many other programs function. Hmm. This isn't quite working for me today, but it usually works like a charm. One more. Try here. Here I'm going to highlight the word checklist and put my link there. This is a checklist that was developed specifically for, here we go. So that link will work just fine. A checklist that will, um, that allows uh, physicians and patients to sit down and talk together. Okay, um, now here, um, the fabulous folks at IE Communications found this really interesting video of a physician um, in San Diego who kind of spearheaded a task force um, that has come up with safe prescribing guidelines that have been adopted um, across the region, and what we what we're going to do, what's very easy to do, is to take a look at go to let's go to YouTube where this video is housed, and take a look at um, you can watch the video of course, and then I'm going to use this share um, sorry use this embed button to grab the embed code um, here, and then I'm going to come back to live stories and um, insert the embed code right here after I click on video and save it. And then it just comes, comes up here. So that's going to work really well. Um, I also crafted like a little bit of text, um, just kind of explains who she is. Um, her name is Dr. Ronit Lev. She's an ER physician. So she's the one that's going to kind of, in our story, be a community-based storyteller that helps um, helps put a human face and a local face on this story, and also serves as an important messenger for other physicians. And somebody came up with the doctors in the know know best headline. Um, that's kind of an interesting one, so I might decide to use that. I, uh, a question for you about um, what you've added hyperlinks at certain points. Is that does that serve as your source line or credit? And how do you how are you handling crediting where you're pulling different assets or materials from? Mm-hmm. Great question. Um, there are a couple of ways to do that. A lot of times I do it in the text, like where you say new, where I say new CDC guidelines for primary care physicians. So we know that when we click on that link, we're going to get to um, we're going to get to a beautiful PDF that was created by the CDC. 
Um, but when it comes to other types of sourcing, I do like, like I might, I might, um, I like to use links, like this drug abuse medical task force. It would be nice to have a link there that would take, take everyone there. Um, so they get the kind of original source material. But at the same time, um, I also use, when it comes to data sources, uh, like to build in sort of the, uh, to keep that title in terms of the source of the data in the chart itself um, uh, where possible. And like here, the source, the California Department of Public Health, um, that works well. You can also build in just like this source. If you want, um, and I know this is this is very much Liz's preference. Do you want to say anything about that? Uh, I mean, I, I do think that where you can provide credit for either an image or um, an asset that you're borrowing and using and building upon um, as, as close in proximity that, as it is to that image, um, the better, because it's just more straightforward and people don't always, again, scroll down and, and see the credit. Um, a couple more questions that have come in. A uh, question, can you send the link to that uh, checklist, the Safe Retirement Checklist? We'll certainly send that along. Uh, and then a question about um, how to spend valuable time and resources. Apart from it being a lot of work, um, this is Pam from Santa Cruz. Hi, Pam. Um, apart from it being a lot of work, is there a benefit to creating a community report card and another story for more specialized data like CARES? Hmm. And, you know, I, I would say that it depends on really what your goals are and who your audience is. I mean, if you have a community report card that really tries to get it at all aspects and ends up and you have, you have various data sets and you're looking at the data um, over time and you feel like that's that how cures is treated within that that larger frame and community report card may get lost in terms of it really being a highlight and you see a story to be told with that cures data. Um, you can't, for one thing, you can't, one of the things that Live Stories has said they're going to work on um, is something called anchor tags, which would mean that, let's say on social media, you want to send people, or in an email or Facebook post, you want to send people just to the cures data. Um, and you want to send them a URL and it will take them inside a community report card but just to the cures section. That's not possible right now. So you would be relying on the user, if you really want them to look at the cures stuff, that they'll be scrolling through and finding it. So it may be that creating another one will be worthwhile. Your thoughts? You know, I, yeah, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an evangelist for talking to audiences and where they are at. and. Uh, to stem the abuse of prescription painkillers, we need to talk to a whole bunch of different people who have different levels of concern, who have different levels of motivation, different values, um, anxieties, and so, I mean, I think that, you know, data is absolutely critical to doing that. It's also insufficient, right? We need to wrap the data in messaging and storytelling that can inform people and get them moving, get them involved in part of the solution. So, so the honest answer is, is, you know, it depends on who your audiences are, but I don't think that a report card is going to be sufficient. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to show you a couple of other really quick things here, um, which is, as I mentioned, it's really easy to move different story sections around in live stories, and the way you do that is by coming over here, and um, since I've labeled this section, get the facts, if I want to move it up, I can simply do that. I guess I don't have enough story sections to do that here. Let me go ahead and show you in a different way. Sorry. So I'm going to add a new story section. Let's take, um, let's, let's insert a simple quote. Um, when you add a new story section, the new story section comes into the bottom, um, the bottom of your live story. And here I'm going to grab this beautiful quote that Liz found from um, somebody who is the chair of the pain task force for the California Society of Anesthesiologists. I'm going to stick the quote in here. Take 
take out my extraneous text. Some people like to have the source just below. This. Okay, and then I go back over here. It's called generically simple quote. Okay, sorry everybody. Um, okay, um, so here's my quote, and over here I'm going to call it Dr. Shaw. And then if I want to kind of, if I want to move Dr. Shaw quote up, all I do is go like this. And so, where'd you go, Dr. Shaw? Okay, there's Dr. Shaw. I can also um, choose a different background color here. Oops, that's too dark. Here, that's too dark. Sorry. Do this. Um, and that kind of also makes it easier for me to kind of follow when I'm moving it where it's going. So I just moved it up here. Just wanted to show you that. Okay, so this is a this is a very rough story, but as you can tell, um, you know, we put it together quickly because we had an outline and we had all the assets and um, we had some data that was already entered into our account and some charts that had already been generated um, and pinned to a dashboard. So um, if you have other questions about live stories, obviously you have a lot of access to uh, the trainers and technicians and uh, creative startup folks over at Live Stories and you'll have a, a more contact with them and as well as uh, IE Communications as a superb intermediary to the Live Stories team. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and go back to our slides. There, but then you'll be at the beginning again. Okay. Okay. All right. So we we want to um, we want to just kind of. So, you know, start wrapping up by talking about some really basic tips for working in live stories um, that we think can kind of help you save time and, and start off on a, on, um, a, a very fruit, a fruitful note. So one of the tips um, is to choose roles. So hopefully you're working in a small, smart team and one of you can, can maybe take on the role of a data maven, somebody who's going to take a stab at curating your data. Um, choosing what needs to be in the story, working with charts and graphs. Maybe you can choose someone who will be the writer. The writer needs to answer this question, what is the core argument we want to illuminate for X goal and Y audience? Um, so the writer also gets to kind of choose a writing style that's going to suit your audience. Is it formal? Is it down to earth? Um, yes, yeah, you get the idea. And someone, if someone can kind of take on a designer role, um, that could be someone who finds photographs or looks at the assets and pulls infographics that are particularly relevant, um, photographs, video, et cetera, maybe chooses a color palette. And I would say one other member of the kind of small team is someone who's really investigating and pulling out those, those stories and, and pulling together from the rich resources that you have as a coalition of diverse stakeholders and pulling out, you know, the writer doesn't have to be the one writing everything, but sometimes it's, it's so much as, hey, let's ask th these leaders in the community and these different stakeholders if they'll share a quote or if they'll share their story and then you can include that and essentially you're outsourcing that writing piece and just kind of organizing and doing the you know, and taking advantage of all the rich resources you have as a coalition. Very good. Okay. 
Um, and then we made the point before, um, less is often more. Um, we'd love you to keep that in mind, but it may not be necessary to be comprehensive in order to be effective. Something for the heart and something for the head. Um, it can be easy to forget this. Um, we know you've got data. You've got a lot of, of quantification and empiricism on your side when it comes to both raising awareness of this issue and um, calling for medically assisted treatment and safe prescribing and naloxone. Um, but what are you going to offer for the heart? What are you, you know, we, we, we can't move people to action unless they care, right? So who in your community can be a storyteller? Who can offer testimony or guidance? Um, maybe a story about what it's like to struggle with addiction and overcome it, um, to crush the stigma related to addiction. You know, how have people come together uh, to, to, to save lives and to make our community safer for young people and elders? Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, collecting local stories. Yeah, so collecting local stories. I mean, this is where, you know, the local story is what is really going to count when it comes to speaking to a local audience. It's really um, capturing what are the stories on the ground. You can have policy change and rhetoric at a national or state level, but if you're looking to change hearts and minds in your own community and behavior change from within, you want to reflect your community and your community's values in in your communications. And then you the, the wonderful thing is you have a ready resource, having built your coalition, um, to reach out to those various stakeholders. Here we see EMT workers with naloxone. You have family perspective. April Rivero um, and her story of becoming an advocate after losing her son, and she's part of one of our coalitions. There's that local story. You could, at your next meeting, hand around uh, three by five cards and ask people to give them a short story or a quote and decide you want to share those maybe on social media or put them together in a live story. They, you are not far away from having access to tremendous stories and perspectives that they can then use to reach out and broaden your audience. Great. Uh, and, and headlines matter. Um, as we've talked about, lots and lots of competing demands for attention. Um, and headlines, if you have a good one, people will click and um, and start to read. Um, you do want to keep in mind that you need to be honest. You don't. People don't like a headline that's a bait and switch. Um, but they, you want to have something in there that's uh, that's fresh and and will grab attention. So you can use data. You can ask questions with the headline. You can um, start with a keyword. You want to think about your audience. They're asking, "What's in it for me?" And by me, we mean the audience you're trying to reach. You can do things. You can use social math. So the, a chart I showed earlier had the headline of, you know, drug overdoses, deaths take, um, or drug overdoses take more lives each year than car accidents. So you're comparing two things. You're doing it in a way that people will say, huh, I didn't really know that. Let me find out more. And that sort of speaks, too, to headlines matter both on text, but don't forget that your data and your charts have headlines. So you should be descriptive as to what they're seeing in the chart, which will go a long way to help them really understand what the chart's representing. Great. Okay, who are your best messengers? We've already talked about the value of local spokespersons, local stories, um, and we want to, we just want to ask you to think a little about who's the best person to deliver a given story or a given message. Okay, invest in photography. Um, invest time and creativity in photography and, and other artwork if you can. Um, it's typically given short shrift, and, and there's nothing wrong with using stock photography if you have to, um, but it can be really limited. It's real people that make the story real. Um, this, is, this image on the left is, is uh, an image that uh, Public Health Institute uh, contracted with a photographer named Tim Wagner, and he went all across the, the state um, taking pictures that really bring the, the um, uh, activism related to healthy eating and active living to life. And it's like this bank of photographs is just like the gift that keeps on giving. 
Um, and it's used over and over again by a whole many different people across the state. So you're you're um, you're all part of a statewide coalition. You're all confronting the same types of challenges. You know, maybe it'd be possible for you to come up with a photo bank and to share images as well. Um, this image on the right is just a. Uh, we, we've been working on a story that is basically about confronting the myths that keep people from getting the flu vaccine. And I'm showing you this because it's been really um, really interesting that the folks in San Diego County have uh, taken real photos of real providers, real kind of um, uh, health officers and nurses um, and community members who are, who are delivering quotes and helping to uh, debunk flu myths. Okay, um, data visualization is all the rage, and it's really an interesting time to kind of get in on it. Um, I'm showing you this book because it was written by somebody who spent several years writing a dissertation about how people are using and not using effective data visualization. Um, her name is Stephanie Evergreen, and um, it's a great primer in terms of visualizing comparisons, ways to visualize survey data, correlation and regression, even qualitative data. Um, I also wanted to draw your attention, if you're into, if you want to take a, if you want to be inspired by a superbly creative and playful data geek, there's a fellow named Nathan Yao you may have heard of. You can follow him on Twitter or look at his blog called Flowing Data. Okay. Um, include a call to action. So this is a call to action that I think comes to us from our ex Dave Marin, and um, it's just simply a simple way to invite people to get involved. So um, you don't want people to arrive at the end of your story, the end of your website, um, without uh, some clear instructions about um, how they can get engaged and get involved and take take part. Um, so without belaboring too much about how you articulate that, please remember to include a call to action. Okay. Oops. Great. Um, so we're going to talk a briefly about um, what you do once you have a story um, distribution. And I'll put in a plug for our July 27th webinar, which is all about spreading the word and distribution to various audiences. So once you do have a live stories link that you want to publish, um, and we've talked about, and, and Pam or Pam from Live Stories could weigh in as well about the different ways that I think we mentioned on the last webinar that you can make a live story um, public. So the, the, uh, you can make it password protected. You could also, um, there might be a third option that you can make it, you know, public only. Searchable, searchable on the web or not searchable on the web. Okay. Yeah. Right. So you could share a live story, say, with your entire coalition preliminarily, or it may be an internal document that you want to remain internal, um, then you could make it public or you could create another one that you make public. So, so there's, there's that to consider. Um, once you're, you're ready for distribution, you know, start with your coalition. You've, you've built a strong list. Ideally, you have regular communication going out to your different action teams, the entire coalition. Rather than just sending a link, you want to provide people with the there's a headline and then there's really the selling point. What will grab people that you want to give them a blurb, what your live story is, what it's about, and why people should click the link. So it's both you want people within the coalition to learn from it and also to share it and spread the word. Um, often that will happen on social media, so Facebook, Twitter, Instagram is another option. Um, you'll want to give them, oftentimes, if you just give a link and say, please share this, and, and oh, well, then I have to think of something to say in 140 characters, go ahead and offer up a few 140 character options. Pull part of a quote out and, and add the link. Pull one of the data points out, add the link, and include that in your email out to coalition so they can say, okay, well, now I can just literally copy and paste this and then, and then share it. So as much as you can do to have it ready to go. We can help you build a media list if you don't already have one to send out um, to local media. And live stories really are an opportunity for you to think about, if I were to get a reporter to come out here and, and do the story on, on MAT, what would I want them to cover? Who would I want them to talk to? This is your chance to 
to build your story, and then you can turn around and send it to media. They may end up being inspired and, and want to do something for their publication. But it's really a way for you to tell, start telling your own story. Um, you want to send it. There's, there's, there's electives and influentials, and you should be building a list of those. They're probably on your list uh, already in your coalition work, but that's another audience where you want to send um, send out and distribute your, your live story. So we will get much more into distribution and spreading the word on our next webinar. Happy to also answer uh, questions having to do with that. Uh, we are going to move into a question and answer and discussion period, so our open um, to your comments, questions, concerns, um, so fire away. Uh, and I do have one that's come in. Um, when it comes to data visualization, and let's say there isn't a match in the asset library, um, and you may have a data point specific to your coalition, what are ways or programs that you use to play with visualization and design? Mm -hmm. So if you don't have a designer in-house, um, there are programs that you can use to make data look nice. What have you used, Laura? And can you maybe show us? You know, um, I have started using Canva.com, and, and, you know, I just find it relatively easy to use. Um, you know, Live Stories is going to visualize your data for you. So it, mm -hmm. when we're talking about working the Live Stories platform, it's really a matter of um, thinking about the best way to visualize that data, what kind, what's the right chart for your data or the right graph, um, and, um, and thinking that through, and then just within the Live Stories platform, clicking on your different chart options, um, and then working with you know, the headlines and the axes and filters and stuff like that to maximize the data. Um, so that's an option. Um, the book that I showed you, the Stephanie Evergreen book, um, She's all about, believe it or not, working with Microsoft products to visualize your data, and she she does absolutely incredible things with it. So, um, but I know people on this call may, people on our webinar today may have other ideas. Maybe some of you have worked in Tableau, or you work in SAS, or you work in um, statistical programs that also allow you to visualize data. So um, there are lots of options. I would say that one of the reasons that we're excited about the Live Choice platform is that it's a very user-friendly option. If you're not tremendously sophisticated um, about using data software, then I think Live Stories will be your friend. Great. Um, so let's see. Looks like we've gotten through our questions. Um, we will give you another couple minutes to ask any other questions that come up. I'll remind you of a couple things in terms of availability and live stories from here on out. Um, I will be available to help with, with crafting and, and building a live story and thinking through the content. Um, and live stories, so you all, and hopefully you've gotten started. Um, if you haven't, um, you have your live stories license. You can go in, navigate through. Um, building charts and building different sections and live stories is available for technical assistance for each coalition. So we encourage you to reach out um, and I'll provide, um, we'll provide contact information for the live stories team here as well for as you're, as you're working through the platform, whatever comes up, whatever you feel like, well, I'd really like to do this, I wonder if it's possible in Live Stories, um, we can talk through that. And I'd add that Live Stories is a tremendous platform that gives you the ability to storytell in, in, a, in a multimedia way, so to use video, to pull out quotes, to use data, um, to, to, to build out a narrative story, photos. So it's a, a platform that's really versatile, that's different than um, what you could do with a, a blank piece of paper. Um, so it's, we encourage you to, to use that resource. At the same time, there may be, there may be things that you're trying to do or stories you're trying to tell, and, and live stories might not be where you want to do it. Um, so we, it may be that, well, what I really need is I need a fact sheet, or um, you know, I really need talking points for a certain audience 
or um, I really need a brochure to reach out um, to that's really on paper because what I'm finding is I need to hand somebody something. In my community, it's not, I can't give them, I, I, I have to hand them a physical document because a URL that's just going to get lost. So you do know your community and um, we want to figure out what's going to work for you. So it's great we have this opportunity to work within live stories, but we also want to recognize that um, the kind of strategic communications we're talking about can happen across a range of platforms. So I think um, we'll go through the last couple slides. If we get more questions that, that pop in, we'll jump back. Um, but just a little bit on, on what's upcoming from CHCF. Uh, we have some webinars in June. On June 8th, from 12.30 to 1.30, buprenorphine for pain, a safer alternative to high-dose or long-term opioid with Dr. Howard Kornfeld. And June 28th, from 12.30 to 1.30, Cures, What a Busy Clinician Needs to Know. And that's with Mike Small, Director of Cures, Dr. Ronit Lev from San Diego, and Jessica Moore, a primary care provider from Petaluma Health Center. And uh, save the date on the fall convenings for the uh, Opioid Safety Coalition's network. Uh, on September 22nd is the Northern California convening in Oakland and also a handful of live video remote sites and November 1st in Southern California with the site still to be determined. Similar agendas for both of those. Uh, keynotes from Dr. Andrew Kolodny, Dr. Corey Waller, and Dr. Andrew Rubenstein, and we'll have a packed agenda aside from that. Um, and for the webinars, just go to the website, chcf.org slash OSCN to register. And yes, we are here for you. So my email, which hopefully most or all of you have already, Laura, you can reach her as well. And for live stories, technical assistance and support, Andy um, and Pam can be reached at, at these emails as well. And we'll, we'll post this, um, this webinar for you soon so you'll have all that information. Uh, let's see if any other questions have come through. Okay, I think we'll give you, in the, in, um, the vein of, of busy people and busy days, we'll give you another 20 minutes and say goodbye and thank you for joining today's webinar. Thanks, everyone.